Hey guys, I'm Heidi with AMP Home Church. Welcome back, Seeing the Unseen by Randy Alcorn. You guys, we're finishing up yet another week. We are on day 80 of our study. We have 10 days left, so two weeks left, and we will be done with our study of this book. This is gonna be one we're gonna to have to read over and over and over again. And I can't tell you how many times something has happened throughout my day and I've gone, oh, like a couple weeks ago in our book and I go and I pull it up and I read it again. And yet again, I'm like, see, Lord, thank you. I love it. So I hope this has been a blessing to you guys. I know it has been for me. If you are new and just joining in, that is awesome and amazing. These are all on a playlist. So you can go back and watch the beginning ones or any of us that need to go back and want to rewatch, you can do that as well. And we hope you guys will come and join us with church this weekend on um, this Sunday at one o'clock Eastern time. My husband will be in Matthew 13. We're doing the parable of the mustard seed this week. And then at 8 30 PM, Pastor Travis will be in Hebrews chapter five, I believe. So, um, I know Hebrews, but I'm pretty sure we're still in chapter five. Um, but that will all be going on in our Facebook group this weekend. Um, we live stream everything there, have prayer and discussion and all of the things in there. So all of that is linked down in that description box. If you want to come and join us and haven't already, we would love to have you there. So let's go ahead. <laughs> I got cute little notes from my kiddos. So let's go ahead and open up to day 80 topic today, steps to greater happiness in Christ. Keywords there, right? Where does our happiness come from? He says the practical experience of happiness in Christ requires our sustained effort. Note that, okay? What steps can you take to be happier? Lord, let's just say we know that everybody out there, even so-called pastors today, are more motivational speakers, right? It's all about how, how do you live your best life? How do you become happy? What do you need to make your life wonderful today? Let's look at this. First and foremost, by God's grace, embrace Christ's work on the cross to pay for your sins and reconcile you to God, right? If you need more on that, go to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21, okay? What could be more happy making than knowing that the God of happiness who grants us eternal life and happiness in Christ? What can be better than that? What? The perfect house, the perfect car, the perfect job, the perfect family, the perfect spouse, the perfect bank account, right? One that never runs out or something. Um, guys, we know the God of happiness. He grants us eternal life and happiness in Christ. What more do you want than that? Once we've been reconciled to God, we can do something more about our happiness by doing what happy people do. Happiness doesn't precede giving and serving. It accompanies and follows it. Giving, serving. Simply recognizing that happiness comes from knowing, loving, and serving God isn't enough. We can take an active role in our happiness by opening God's word, going to a Bible study, joining a church, volunteering at a homeless shelter, or writing a check to support Bible translation for unreached people groups. What are we doing? The unhappiest of people are usually the ones who are sitting there going, it's everybody's fault that I'm not happy and my life is awful. No, it's your fault that you're unhappy and your life feels awful, right? It, 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 it's, it's not anybody else's life. Sure, other people do things, but it's not their job to make you happy. Nobody's walking around with, you know, the, the, nobody owes you anything, right? Everything has already been paid through Christ. Go, love, serve, give. Give of whatever you can. You'll find happiness. Find it in the Lord, right? Insanity is doing the same things over and over while expecting different results. If we want new and better results when it comes to our happiness, we must step out and try something different. If you are unhappy, if you've been unhappy, if you find yourself in a state of unhappiness, try something different. Okay, let's give it a shot. Let's look at James chapter 1, verse 25. It says, if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Romans 12, verses 6 and 8 say, let us use our spiritual gifts, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, right? George Washington Carver was quoted saying, living for others is really the Christ life after all. Oh, the satisfaction, happiness, and joy one gets out of it. We don't sit around going, what do I need to do to make me happy? What do I need? What do I want? What do I have to have, right? We, we don't have to have 
anything. The only thing we have to have is breath, and God gives us that. So if God gave you that today, you have what you need. End of story. End of story. Living for others is the Christ way. David Mathis said, sacrificial service in the church doesn't start with serving. It starts with being served by God. Then as we are satisfied in him and who he's revealed himself to be in his crucified son, we gladly overflow in service of others. All right, let's look at God's plan for us includes happiness in him. That's epm.org forward slash plan happiness. So let's go ahead and pull that up and see what we have today. Okay, so this was an interview that he did um, back in 2016 um, that was originally posted on lifeway.com. So um, let me just scroll down to where he's actually talking. So the question being, why did you write a book on happiness and how do you define happiness? I think that's a topic that many of us have confusion on, right? So let's look at this. He says, among Christ followers, there's a tendency to minimize happiness and make it sound unspiritual because people in the world are trying to find happiness in sin. I argue in the book, the problem isn't they're trying to be happy. Rather, God wired us to seek happiness. The problem is we seek happiness in the wrong places rather than in the right place in Christ. The Bible tells us explicitly the gospel is very much about happiness. Consider Isaiah 52, 7, which says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness. Paul clearly refers to Isaiah 52, 7 in Romans 10, 15, as he references the gospel, demonstrating this good news of happiness is in fact nothing else but the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. The gospel is about bringing a deliverance from sin, of course, but the result is to be not only our holiness, but also our personal happiness. True holiness, not the false, pharmaceutical, self-exalting kind, and true happiness, not the false, superficial, sin-seeking kind, are two sides of the same coin. Happy holiness is God's ideal for us, right? Sorry, I've got like something on my nose. <laughs> it's itching. Um, so, not self-exalting and not superficial sin seeking, right? But happy holiness is God's ideal for us. Webster's Dictionary defines happiness as, wait for it, listen, the state of being happy. Imagine that. The Dictionary of Bible Themes gives a more biblical definition of happiness. It says, a state of pleasure or joy experienced both by people and by God, True happiness derives from a secure and settled knowledge of God and a rejoicing in his works and covenant faithfulness. Guys, when we see Paul, he says, I am content in all things. I have, he says in Philippians, I have learned to live with much or with little, right? And I am content finding joy in all things. And that is because of this, because it's a state of pleasure or joy experienced both by people and by God. True happiness derives from a secure and settled knowledge of God and a rejoicing in his works and covenant faithfulness. I don't care if I'm homeless. I don't care if I'm sick. I don't care if the world is against me because my happiness does not come from anything here. Sure. Do I enjoy things? Absolutely. And I'm thankful for them, but I hold them with an open hand. They can be here today and gone tomorrow. Yes, I'm enjoying things, but the, the, the source of my happiness, of my joy, of my contentment comes from the Lord in his works, his promises, his doings, right? Not my material doings, but his eternal doings. Does that make sense? Excuse my kids who are very rambunctious today. So would you say the Bible teaches that God is happy? Short answer, yes. The Apostle Paul wrote of the gospel of the glory of the blessed, God with which I have been entrusted in 1 Timothy 1.11. At the end of 1 Timothy, he refers to God as he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we see that in 1 Timothy 6.15. As I explore happiness, numerous language scholars and lexicons attest that the Greek adjective makarios, translated here as blessed, actually means happy. 1 Timothy 1.11 and 6.15 actually speak of the gospel of the happy God and the God who is the happy and only sovereign. In your presence there is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's Psalm 16.11. 
as love and holiness are found in God's presence because God is loving and holy, so joy and happiness are found in God's presence because God is joyful and happy. How could it be otherwise? Yes, I believe God desires us to seek and find our happiness in him, the source of all joy. Contemplate these words, right? In number six, verses 25 through 26, it says, The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Isn't this a call for God to endow his people with happiness? If we grasp just how happiness saturated scripture is, it will radically affect our perspectives as God's children and greatly expand our outreach to the world. Whatever else the plan of God and the gospel of Jesus encompasses, without question, it includes our happiness. Of course, if we compare the value of our happiness to the value of God and his glory, our happiness is infinitely outweighed. But the same is true of everything else. Just because God and his glory are infinitely more important than our families, friendships, churches, and jobs, that doesn't mean any of those are unimportant. Indeed, God himself tells us they are important. So, is it selfish to pursue happiness? This distorted notion that wanting to be happy is inherently selfish and therefore immoral is believed by many Christians. It's true that scripture warns of a self-love that is obviously wrong, 2 Timothy 3, 2, which you guys, we see so often, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, goes on and on. Uh, we don't want anything with that. But when Jesus tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves, right, we see that Matthew 22, 39, and a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He isn't arguing that we shouldn't love ourselves, only that we should extend our instincts for self-care to the caring of others, right? I would care for myself in this way. I need to extend that to you as my brother or sister, my neighbor all around. Some parents believe looking after their children's happiness means constantly saying no to their own. But if they don't take care of themselves, failing to cultivate and model happiness in God, they'll deprive their children of happiness too. Flight crews routinely announce, if you're traveling with a child, there's someone who requires assistance in the case of emergency. Secure your own oxygen mask first before helping the other person, right? Any of us that fly, you've heard that before. Those instructions may sound selfish, just as it sounds selfish to say that one of our main duties in life is to find happiness in God. But only when we're delighting in our Lord do we have far more to offer everyone else, right? If I am not delighting in the Lord, if I have not found my happiness in that, how am I truly serving my spouse, my children, my family, my friends, anyone else the Lord brings into my life, right? And that's where it's so easy to tell. It really is. The more and more as you grow in your biblical literacy and your spiritual maturity, it's so easy to tell people that are not truly delighting in the Lord because you see it in how unhappy they really are. Does a person's happiness depend on their circumstances? Yes and no. In our fallen world, troubles and challenges are constants. Happy people look beyond their circumstances to someone so big that by his grace, even great difficulties become manageable and provide opportunities for a deeper kind of happiness. Our troubles and our issues should only deepen our happiness and our understanding and our thankfulness and our reliance upon the Lord. Part of being a Christian is experiencing the underlying and overreaching happiness in Christ that goes beyond circumstances, far beyond it, guys. It's a process, I understand that, but it's one we should be growing and improving in daily because our focus in God's word and, and growing with him happens daily. Our happiness is dependent not on temporary circumstances, but on our eternal perspective, amen? Still, it's fair to recognize positive life circumstances can prompt real and emotional joy and happiness. Absolutely, they can. This is an important correction to the modern sentiment that being happy due to positive circumstances, including the welfare of loved ones, is somehow unspiritual. True, circumstances change and our happiness should be grounded on Christ who doesn't change, but that doesn't make it inappropriate to rejoice in favorable circumstances. Sure, we can get excited when good things happen. Amen. But is that where we find the source of our contentment and our joy, right? That, that's the hard issue we're trying to see the difference of here. How can we be happy when there's so much evil and suffering in the world? Romans 8, 28 says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. By recognizing and believing in God's sovereignty, even over Satan's work, remember, our perspective is transformed. The gospel's good news is because of Christ's death and resurrection. Happiness, not sorrow, has the last word. 
and it will have the last word forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, right? This secure future invades our present so that even while death and sorrow remain, the new normal in Christ isn't sorrow, but happiness. We certainly live in a world filled with suffering and death, but as believers, we understand God is with us and won't forsake us. And one day we'll live on a redeemed earth, a place full of joy and delight. Yes, this day hasn't come yet, or this day hasn't yet come when God will wipe away every tear from his children's eyes, like we see in Revelation 21 verse 4, but it will come. Anticipating this reality has breathtaking implications for our present happiness. I give that example, guys. If I said, hey, at the end of this month, guess what? You're going to win the lottery. You are going to win $100 million, right? You'd be pretty excited. You would go on the rest of this month thinking there are things that you'd let go and you'd say, you know what? It was a big deal to me yesterday. It's not today because I know at the end of this month, I'm winning $100 million. I'm not worried about it. You're not going to stress out over your car and over this and over all these different things. You say, hey, it's going to be taken care of. It's okay. I'm going about things with a, a different attitude. So if we can understand that idea, how much more, like eternity and everything promised to us from the Lord is like so much better than $100 million, right? <laughs> it, it's eternal. It's $100 million would run out. God does not. So it's that same type of mindset as we are going through things and we're seeing the evil and we're seeing us. We go, I know. I know, but that, that's, not where my, that's not where my fight is. That's not where my focus is. It's on the Lord. It's on his ways and it's on sharing it and living it, right? Should we only find happiness in God or is it okay to be happy with our family, friends, work, pets, flowers, and forests? God is primary, okay? We've got to have our priorities in order. Is God primary? All other forms of happiness, relationships, created things, material pleasures, they're secondary. If we don't consciously see God as their source, these secondary things intended for enjoyment can master us. Are you sober minded or are you being mastered by these things? If your focus is constantly on the things that you need or you have to have or have to get better or whatever you want to say, you have an issue with your priorities. Okay. But by recognizing God as primary, we maximize our enjoyment of the secondary with no danger of idolizing it. An idol is anything that is taking the place of God in your life. It can be a relationship. It can be material possessions. It can be career. It can be money. It can be literally anything can be an idol. What are you putting over your relationship with the Lord, your knowledge of him, your focus on him, your trust in him? The better I know Jesus, the more I see him all around me in people, animals, places, and objects. When I find happiness in playing with and hugging our golden retriever, Maggie, I am finding happiness in God, who I recognize as her maker and the gracious father who entrusted her to our care. I'm in no danger of making Maggie an idol, a God substitute, when I recognize and praise him for her and thank him for the joy he imparts to us through her. Truly, guys, we test everything. You could be making an idol out of your spouse, out of your children, animals specifically, causes and, and focuses, right? We just had this conversation in church on Wednesday. The idol of chasing, revealing the evils of this world and conspiracy theories and things of that nature. Guys, are they pretty much all true? Yes, they are because there's real evil, but that's not our fight. That's not our focus. That's not it. We're not here to be keyboard warriors. We're not here to be those. No, we're here to show Christ and edify the church. Is that what we're doing? Are we serving the Lord? Are we truly just emanating that out of our being? If we are holding up animals as idols, job as idol, car, home as idol, that's a big one, then we're not doing those things. When we invite God into our happiness, we become aware of how he invites us into his. The happiest times of my life are when I've entered into the happiness of God, not only through Bible study, prayer, and church, but also when reading a good book, laughing with a friend, running, biking, and enjoying the wonders of creation. Next question. What can we say to people who seek happiness in sin instead of in Jesus? Scripture recognizes there are fleeting pleasures of sin. We see that in Hebrews 11.25. An injection of heroin or an immoral act can bring moments of pleasure, but not deep and lasting happiness. Sin can, for the short term, make us happy, but it won't leave us happy. Clear distinction. I think all of us who have lived in our sin, we know, oh yeah, I, I was happy in that moment. Um, it didn't leave me that way. It actually left me the opposite. 
In fact, the biggest enemy of happiness because it results in a broken relationship. Oh, sorry. In fact, it's the biggest enemy of happiness because it results in a broken relationship with God. Okay. But instead of backing away from happiness or trying to correct those who love the word happiness, which almost everyone does, except some inside the church, that's hilarious, we should embrace it, realizing that Jesus is inseparable from happiness. If someone declares a desire to be happy, we should never say, you just need to obey God and forget about being happy. Rather, we should say, God wired you that way. Then we can ask, have the things you've thought would make you happy always worked for you? The answer is probably no. I love that question. That's the time to suggest maybe you haven't looked in the right place. We can then present the Bible's bad news, which explains the sin problem that makes them un unhappy. Then we can share the good news of the gift of God that can reconcile them to their holy creator and thereby make them eternally happy. I love this last little passage here, you guys. How's that working out for you? But let's look at our own lives in this. The things that you think are going to make you happy. How's that working for you? Trust God. Give it to him. Let him be the source of our true, 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 true happiness. And the more and more we get our priorities and our focus straight, the more and more, yes, we see him in everything that makes us happy. I know there are times, guys, on the regular where I have to just fall to my knees in prayers of things because I go, how did you give me this, right? How did you give me these children? How do you, you trees, you know, you go through all these things. I mean, that's why I love, you know, my plants and working with flowers and things like that. Cause I go, God created all of these things. This is phenomenal. Like, look at this source of happiness. And I think of my, my garden in heaven. Oh my goodness, you guys, I cannot wait. The things, you know, it just, it's so exciting, but it's because God, the father is good and perfect and happy. He gives us all joy. I hope this study today really helped you guys. I hope all of this, you know, really has. If there's anything at all we can do for you, please reach out and let us know. Otherwise, you guys, go and enjoy your weekend. Let's really take these things to our heart, to prayer. Ask the Lord to convict us where we need convicting. Make sure our priorities are in line. We're not going around holding up the mirror to everyone else. We're holding it up to ourselves. And then we are constantly growing in our spiritual walk with the Lord so that we don't need to go force it upon anyone because it is just emanating out from us. Amen. So praying this blesses you all. I hope to see you all in church on Sunday. Anything we can do, reach out and let us know. Otherwise, we'll be back here next week. Bye, guys.